All right, we still got a few more people trickling in. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kaylee and I manage our virtual experiences department here at Farniente Family of Wineries. Um, and tonight we have a fabulous lineup for you, sustainability from the ground up. Uh, and we are joined by John McCarthy, who is our director of vineyard operations here at Farniente Family of Wineries. And then we are hosted and joined by Heather Gunn, one of our private client services concierge and virtual host extraordinaire. And uh, just a few ground rules before we get started. So if you have any questions that do come up during the webinar, go ahead and put those in the Q&A section. Um, we can answer those live. And then if you want to comment on what's being talked about, you can go ahead and put that in the chat section. But then I do encourage you to keep those questions and if you can hold on to them until the end and ask them live because we will promote everybody to panelists where we encourage you to turn on your cameras and participate in that live Q&A with John and Heather. Um, so without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Heather. So cheers, you guys. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Kaylee, for the introduction and another great big thank you to everyone joining us this evening. John is a wealth of information on many of the vineyard topics we've all wondered so much about. The viticulture aspect of making fine wine is crucial. Winemakers often say that if everything is done right out in the vineyard, it makes their job that much easier and they can make even better wine for years to come. So we're going to be diving deep into the vineyards on these three wines that we're going to be featuring this evening. So as Kaylee mentioned, if you would like any additional information, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A in the chat. You can also use the raise your hand feature. We'll be monitoring that as well. And we've received so many excellent questions in advance, and I'll do my best to keep us on track with all the insightful details of our vineyard practices that John will be sharing with us. And we also encourage you to tag us on your social media using the handles in the chat. Those should be showing up in just a few moments. And we're going to be starting with the 2020 Farniente Chardonnay. So without further ado, let's go ahead and grab a glass of that. And cheers to everyone. We have a lot of ground to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. So John, you just celebrated 13 months with us. Tell us a little bit about Oh, I think. Uh, are we back? Did I cut out or did you cut out? <laughs> I think Heather cut out, but we're back. <laughs> okay. Well, I Go think ahead. I know what the question was. <laughs> oh, what part did I cut out at? <laughs> um, you know, it's typical right at the beginning, you know. <laughs> oh, no. Pains. Uh, yes, um, new to the company, one of the newbies, 13 months in now. Um, really happy to be here. Lo love the culture, love the people. It's been a, it's been a great experience, but I, uh, I, I took about 12 or 13 years to get here. Um, I was able to uh, work with some other industry leaders growing fruit uh, throughout Napa, Lake, Sonoma, and um, every, everything was always growing and selling. So I'm having a lot of fun now because this is a uh, big production goals and I do a lot of growing and buying of fruit now. So um, similar but different. Excellent. Yes, we are definitely growing. And before we jump into this wine, how are the vineyards looking for this year? You mentioned uh, the rain uh, that the Saxon Priest Vineyard uh, got last night. Um, so how's everything looking in Napa Valley and over in Sonoma? Yeah, you know, everything's looking really good. It, it, it really is. And we all know we're, we're, we're in a drought. Um, we've had almost two months of, of no rain. And for all the repercussions that those can, can bring to the table, um, the good news is we were able to stay caught up on work, um, and that, that warm weather actually is promoting a very uniform start to the season, so we're going to benefit from that, and uh, we had some recent rains, you know, a half an inch on average, um, the Saxon Priest Vineyard, yeah, uh, up to an inch and a half there, um, but stand, on average about, about half an inch, um, but it's really shaping up to look like a quality start, so what we're hoping for as we reach that next phenological phase uh, of bloom is that maybe the rains can just, you know, 
take a pause for a few days, let us get some nice fruit set, a healthy crop and, and bring in something that the winemakers are gonna be able to, you know, you know, work their magic with. And do our varietals, they all have bud break at the same time or does that vary? And does the sub region or the sub AVA have any influence on that? Yeah, yeah, uh, well, generally speaking, they, they, bud, they break bud at different times, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to, to really kind of put it in a nutshell, you will have Chardonnay start, Pinot Noir is kind of in the middle and Cabernet is always last. It's, it's, uh, it's a, late, a late starter, but this year was unique because of those two months of, of dry weather, we had soil temperatures warm up mm -hmm. and there were some instances, we had a hillside Cabernet vineyard with, you know, facing the east. So it got all that morning sun warmed up quickly. And, and some of the, uh, some of that, some of those sites, we saw bud break and Cabernet before Chardonnay. I mean, definitely an anomaly, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it just goes to show how every year can be different. Mother nature's throwing curveballs right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and people say April showers bring May flowers, right? So are we still hoping for more <laughs> rain at this point? Would that be beneficial? I, yes. Um, I like that saying, I, I hope we get more April showers. I do. I, I think that we'll take every drop we can get right now. I don't think we're out of the woods on the drought, no matter what happens between now and next month. Um, but we'll take every drop we can get. Hopefully not, not throughout the period of bloom when, when, we, when the fruit sets and we get each berry. But yes, um, we'll take it. Whatever repercussion it comes, we'll handle and we'll manage. We'll take every drop. We can. You have to be flexible, right? <laughs> yes. So let's go ahead and talk about this Chardonnay. So this fruit is pretty unique. Uh, these grapes are grown in the southern part of Napa Valley. What makes this region so unique to grow this Chardonnay? So we we own uh, a good third to half of the vineyards that are going into this this wine, and our vineyards, our Chardonnay vineyards, are in the Coombsville ABA, which is which is very unique. Um, it's it's a it's an ideal spot for growing grapes, and what we've seen is all our neighbors and everyone in, within that whole region has has kind of switched to Cabernet. Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and the, the economics would justify that. Uh, the beauty of working for a company like Farniente is that the decisions being made in-house are, you know, not always factoring in just the bottom line. So it's kind of special to see like the winemakers um, decision making and saying, hey, we need to stay true to this brand. We're based on Chardonnay from Coonsville, mm -hmm. and we're not going to put Cabernet in there, even though it might fetch a more profitable, you know, uh, a, a margin. Um, so I think that's what really makes makes it special, uh, just just from you know uh, kind of a higher elevation perspective, is that we're, we're we're the only people growing Chardonnay in this region. And how old are these vines? And typically, what's the life cycle? And some of these uh, cuttings were originally brought over from France by Gil Nickel, correct? The Charlemagne clones that are pretty unique to this Chardonnay that we've been making for over forty years now. That's right. Uh, it was 1981. Gil Nickel. I don't know how he did it, but he brought over a few cuttings of what we call the Charlemagne clone. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a proprietary term we use uh, loosely, um, but it's, it's all obviously Burgundian French uh, clones that you don't see elsewhere. So even though they're in the FPS system, they're, they're, in, the, they're in the UC Davis um, field plant services system, you can't go buy these. And so our vineyards are, we still have quite a few of the original plantings that are reaching 30 years old. And so we're starting to we're starting to think about the next phase, phase two uh, of these vineyard sites, mm -hmm. and we we have to rely on our on ourselves to supply this budwood to continue the life of these clones. Um, there's no one else that has them, and so we have to go out there and put in the work, the time, the energy. We need to source it, make sure it's clean, free of virus, um, and then propagate it to 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 uh, a number that's going to fit the acreage we're trying to replant. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's just something special. It's something that really makes us unique as a, as a Chardonnay brand. Mm -hmm. Well, and it definitely makes this Farniente Chardonnay unique. Like I'm not a big Chardonnay fan, but this is one of my favorites. And we hear that a lot from folks at the winery. Um, and let's go ahead and dive into the tasting notes on this Chardonnay. So this is the 2020 vintage, which is tasting great. And it really has these rich aromas of white fig, citrus blossom, lemon zest, and then on the palate, uh, it's just very crisp and light and silky. Uh, has these honeydew notes, nectarine, uh, more lemon zest. This is aged in French oak for about 11 months, 53% new French oak, 
and 47% once used. We only use French oak throughout the entire Farniente portfolio. And these grapes were harvested August 25th through September 19th. I think that was before your time, John, correct? <laughs> so you probably weren't part of this harvest. And then uh, the soils down there, uh, very well-drained, gravelly, volcanic ash. So how much of what we're experiencing with this wine has to do with that terroir, that sense of place in Southern Napa Valley down in Coombsville? I, I would say a lot. You know, when I think of terroir, I'm, I'm thinking of the soils, the climate, you know, the water, you know, all, all, all the things that go into those three components. I think you can easily justify the management going into each vineyard as well. And then, you know, the synergy between that fruit and the winemaking practice is really where, where it gets special. And, and Nicole Marchese is, is the winemaker here. I think she's been here for 20 years, almost 20 years. And she's really, really good. She's really talented with this. And um, the Charlemagne clones, what, from, what, from what she would say, uh, is that they have kind of a texturally driven component, you know, and, and oiliness in the mouthfeel um, that, that's really unique and special to this wine. You know, this isn't, this isn't like your, when you think of Chardonnays, this isn't like your California Chardonnay. This doesn't go through malolactic fermentation like a lot do, but it's also not on the other end of the spectrum. You know, it's not like an austere. It's not, it's not too old world. There's still some, there's a balance there. And I think that's what really makes it special. Mm -hmm. And we have a few questions in the uh, Q and A here. Someone asked, where is Coombsville? Oh. Um, so just real quick, Coombsville is going to be the Southern Eastern side hillsides of of the Napa Valley. So if you're in the town of Napa, it's it's just east. Mm -hmm. Look, it's really nice afternoon sun. It's kind of generally speaking, the Coombsville ABA is going to be at the base of those eastern hills. So it faces west. Great afternoon exposure. And you get those cooling winds from the San Pablo Bay, which Chardonnay loves, correct? A hundred percent. And and the, the the soils are appropriately named the Coombs Gravelly Loam Soil Series. Mm. And then we have one other question here. We heard some vines are 30 years old. Is that young or old? We get that <laughs> question a lot at the winery as well uh, when we're giving tours. So a lot of the vines look different, different ages, of course. That's that's a mature vineyard for mm -hmm. sure. That That is a, uh, you know, in, in the older days, 30 years was about where you would get with a vineyard lifespan before you replant. And I think I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you know, now with, with, with advancements in, in research and, and science behind pest control, you know, we're, we're able to um, expect 40 years out of a vineyard. So, so a lot of the new plantings, you know, we're planning on 40 years um, and, and, and we'll, we'll see every day of that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And uh, let's go ahead and touch on some of our certifications. So Far Niente has really been focusing on our sustainability practices over the past several years. Uh, I know we recently received some certifications and we get a lot of questions about this as well in the tasting room. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what yeah. you're specifically looking for when it comes to being this steward of the land, if you will? Yeah, I mean, licensing and, and certifications, they're, they're, they're very important. They're, they're absolutely very important. They tell a story. They show, you're, they show you're serious about what you're doing. They show a commitment. They show you're, you're willing to adhere to criteria. Um, and I think to take a step back as well, you know, there's, there's several certification programs. And right now, I mean, we're seeing more, more awareness, more efforts, um, more commitment than, than we've ever seen before. Um, regardless of what program, you know, you're in or, or what we're in, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be you know, pinned against one another. It's, it's just really for the greater good of our industry. It's really nice to see everyone having that same greater good um, in mind, which is really focusing on our future and, and making sure that we're being stewards of the land and, and still letting the farmers prevail. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with our solar energy on the properties at Farniente, Nickel, Nickel. Can you touch on that a little bit as well? Um, not super in depth, because I know that's uh, Greg <laughs> Allen's expertise, our Dolce winemaker, this, that was his creation at Farniente. Uh, but we are trying to use these renewable energy sources, uh, conserve water as much as possible. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that, it's, that's what it's about. It's about clean energy. And that's, as I, I can only speak for, for Farniente, but I mean, we, we're looking to reduce fossil fuel emissions and conserve water as much as possible. And that's gonna be finding clean energy sources to, to, to replace. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, as, as Greg will know much better than me, but the solar panels are just a small representation of that. You know, the, I know they're offsetting our energy use. 
Um, they have added benefit of covering. We actually have the solar panels on our reservoirs. So it's, it's space that wasn't going to be utilized for vineyard or something else. So that's, it's nice that they're there to do that. And then they also protect the sunlight penetrating through the, the reservoir water and adding to algae blooms. So, so it's, you know, there's, it's a win-win. Um, but but um, I believe, and I'm, I might be talking out of turn, but it was pioneering uh, that, that side of things with, with, you know, floating solar panels. And I believe a lot of um, other companies, greater companies have come to check it out and mimic it or grow on it, you know, and uh, it was groundbreaking for its time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And that's what we've been told that Gil Nickel was this innovative, um, had this innovative vision and he planned on Farniente Nickel, Nickel being around for a very long time and being stewards of the land because they were in the nursery business. So they did care about that for future use, for sure. Right. right. So I believe we have some images to share here. Kaylee's going to pop those up. Uh, and then John, if you could just touch on each of these, uh, because I believe these are your images uh, out in the field. So we have some solar panels. Uh, then we're going to have some bees in the vineyard and then some of the owl boxes and the shade cloth that we utilize out in the vineyards as well. Absolutely. And I, I don't know how I got all my photos in here. My, my wife, <laughs> I'm a good photographer, but somehow I'm, I've, I've taken most of these on the slideshow and, and they've made it. So, so the solar panels, I really don't have much to add. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I've spoken to the extent I know about these. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next slide. Great. <clears throat> We, yeah, so one of our vineyards is in Carneros. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, this might be a fun fact, but grapevines are self-pollinating. We don't actually, we're one of the crops that, that um, does not rely on bees to pollinate. But that doesn't mean we can't like promote ecology, right, and biodiversity. So why not? We have the property, we bring in the companies that have bees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't pay for that, they don't pay it. We, we get a couple, we get a couple jars of honey at the end of the year, but we're, <laughs> if we just let them come and you know, find some pollen from the from the wildflower wildflowers around, and mm -hmm. potentially some cover crops. We just we we offer up our land just to, you know, be 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 good neighbors. Great. And then the next image we have uh, the owl boxes and the shade cloth used out. And which vineyard is this? This is our nickel and nickel dragonfly vineyard. Oh, Western Saint Helena. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can talk quite a bit about the owl boxes, but I, I typically, <laughs> but I, I find it fascinating. You know, there's there's a whole science behind it, and you know, in a nutshell, what you're, what you're doing is is you promote owls, and then they can control the vertebrate pests in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, but to go into a little deeper, you know, if you can put these next to trees or some sort of um, structure, uh, you can actually promote a family of owls. So mom and dad have to go out and, and come back with four or five gophers or you know, the voles at night and, and feed the family and actually do a really effective job. And then you can, that, that eliminates any need for like sending guys through to trap or, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, any, any sort of those um, poison products that we would put out there. Um, yeah, a more natural method of pest it, control, essentially. And it's effective. It's really effective. So, so we're able to implement those and, and, you know, they have, they've done the math on how many you put per, you know, how many acres and what direction to face them and all that. So, it's a fun, it's a fun project to, to tackle. And, and then you can actually see the, see the results out there. You can go out at night and actually see those things flying around. It's, it's pretty cool. Do we have those in quite a few of our vineyards? Yeah, you know, we do. We have them in almost every vineyard, but it's time to recycle it. It's time, it's time to go through phase two. They, they, they're made of wood. Um, they're out in the elements. Um, eventually they, they deteriorate. Um, so it's uh, this year we're actually tackling that quite aggressively and we're going to be going out and installing new owl boxes across almost all the ranches. All right, excellent. Well, let's go ahead and move on to our next wine. We have three wines to taste here. Uh, next up, uh, this is one of our newest Pinot Noirs, that one of our newest vineyards uh, that I believe you know quite a bit about, John. This is our 2019 en route Saxon Priest single vineyard Pinot Noir. So all this fruit is coming from the Saxon Priest vineyard. And go ahead and start sipping on that if you already have it poured. If you don't have it poured, go ahead and pour a little in your glass or or a lot. It is Friday. And John, can you just share with us where this vineyard is located and what makes it so unique for growing Pinot Noir? This is my favorite Pinot Noir vineyard in our portfolio. This vineyard is, this vineyard is close to the town of Occidental, the small town in like the, the, the western hills of Sonoma County. I mean, you're not far from the Pacific Ocean here. This, this is different than, than, than almost all the Sonoma sites in, in, in um, for Pinot because it's just such a cool climate. 
Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, that's there's a lot of factors here, but the main factor is the climate. Mm -hmm. This place, it can be 100 degrees in Napa. It rarely breaks 85 at this vineyard. It rarely, rarely. So if we have a heat spike, I, I'll typically plan my day around the Sonoma County vineyard visits. <laughs> uh, the soils are great. The soils are amazing. I mean, you, you, as you may or may not have heard, you know, that they're... The, the talk of Sonoma County soils is the Gold Ridge loam. Mm. This is this is the epicenter of Gold Ridge loam. So this is like the top quality soils for growing grapes in Sonoma County. And it's got one of the coolest climates you can find. There's not many vineyards west of here. And you can drive up the hill a few minutes and see the Pacific Ocean, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I think that really adds some character to this wine that differentiates it from our other Pinots and, and most definitely other Sonoma Pinots, but in our portfolio. This is going to be more of an older world style. This is going to be cooler climate, bright acidity, um, kind of an austere wine. I, I think that this one is uh, is distinctively different than all of our other Pinots. And what are some of the more challenging aspects when growing Pinot Noir? I know it's the diva of the wine grape world, but how finicky is it really? It's pretty finicky, yeah. I, I, I have to say, um, it's, it's as we mentioned, it comes out, um, breaks bud early. So it starts growth early and it's, it's pretty sensitive to frost. So Sonoma can have pockets of cold weather. And so as the shoot tips are emerging, you know, the vines are getting going, you can have a cold night and just knock it all back. And that's devastating. Um, Pinot also has a, uh, a unique challenge called Pinot leaf curl. It's like a nutritional metabolism uh, uh, challenge issue in the vine. Um, but you can get necrosis of the shoot tips. It, 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 it looks devastating. It's, it's a phenomenon. We can't really mitigate this, but it's called Pinot leaf curl. It doesn't happen to the other varieties that we grow, and it'll just it'll just kind of crash, necrosis, um, and that's tough. That's tough. That's tough to grow through and tough to tough to plan on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other one, I would say, it's not necessarily directly related to Pinot, but to the Pinot sites. So in Sonoma County, there can be there can be real challenges with water. It's not like Napa, where you have like this crushed volcanic rock with with natural reservoirs for pulling water out of it's it's old it's old ocean bottom you can put a well in and find nothing you know and so what we find out there is even though they have better you know some significant rainfall at this vineyard um we don't have any option but to be very very careful with our water mm. very careful i mean there is we're talking a couple gallons a minute coming out of our our water source mm -hmm. and so we have no choice but to really really concentrate focus on that but for the most part, vines don't need a lot of irrigation, correct? I, or I think we're going to dive into this a little bit um, later, but uh, okay, okay, <laughs> we'll save that. Let's hit on the tasting notes right now for the uh, Saxon Priest, the Pinot Noir. So this is very aromatic, uh, aromatic, excuse me, um, as are most of our en route Pinot Noirs. Uh, most of you have probably had the Le Palmier. Uh, that is a blend of a few of the vineyards. This, however, all this fruit is coming from the Saxon Priest vineyard. Um, and as John mentioned, it is very lively. It does have a pretty high um, acidic nature to it. Uh, but the aromas, you get a clove, cedar, dark plum. Um, on the palate, uh, you get some like purple plum, black cherry, the tannins are very well integrated. It has this earthiness, like an old world red, and then it balances out with these layers of ripe fruit. So I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, it is a 2019, so if you can even let it age a bit longer, you may see some benefits from that, but it is very drinkable now, of course. 10 day skin contact, aged in French oak for 16 months. Mm, delicious. And this is very versatile. You could really pair this with all kinds of food um, all throughout the year. If you have a, a lighter diet, it would pair really well with that. Uh, I know Michael Curso, one of his favorite dishes to make with the Pinot Noirs is a duck and mushroom risotto. So if you're in the mood for that uh, in the coming months, that's a great recipe to make with this as well. <laughs> All right, let's touch on, let's see. So we're gonna focus back on sustainability and water conservation. So 
Uh, I've heard this is one of your favorite vineyards. Have you, have we ever implemented anything specifically in this vineyard to aid in our sustainability efforts? You touched on that a bit, like we are looking for those um, water resources over there. Um, and then when, do we also rotate the cover crop depending on the vineyard uh, over in Sonoma County? Yeah, I, I think to answer the first question, you know, there's some, I guess what you could call natural sustainability inherent in this, in this vineyard. Um, when, when, when you think of like the, the challenges we're facing with climate change and how we're seeing gradual increases in temperatures and increases in, in heat spike events, um, proximity to larger bodies of water like the Pacific Ocean or San Pablo Bay actually has a less steep um, curve of, of heat increase. Uh, so, so there's just a way to look at the future here and know that we're still gonna be able to grow Pinot Noir in 30 years time because even though the interior might be getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it's actually quite less impactful on these sites that are next to the Pacific Ocean or larger bodies of water. So, so that's, that's one, you know, like large perspective of, of sustainability there is just kind of is the climate. The climate is actually going to maintain there a lot better than other places. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really cool. Um, one thing that, that we're doing is, is replanting the vineyard. We did five acres in 2017 and that's in full production now. This wine, this wine's going to benefit for some nice, young, clean Pinot Noir clones. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do another six acres after harvest this year. Mm -hmm. And we're we're going back in with with new, um, you know, clean clones from UC Davis, uh, the FPS clones. Mm -hmm. um, really cool stuff. And to kind of like drive the in, the, the the infrastructure that's going to benefit climate change and sustainability efforts as we as we look to the future. We have to look at like the direction of our rows. You know, if we if we if we put the direction of the rows at a very specific angle off north, which is 37 degrees, um, then what, what what we have is actually a very uniform ripening environment from the morning side of the vine row to the afternoon side, and that also brings the the sun over the very top of the vine, um, where the fruit is most protected at the hottest part of the day. So those those kinds of factors are. are that's driving decision making now as we as we move forward. We're also we're also having different infrastructure on the trellis, so we're using cross arms, giving giving the canopy a bit of a relaxed um, vertical shoot position, um, and 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 that the same thing. You know, we'll, we'll go in there, we'll be able to control the canopy, minimize water needs for the vine. Um, you know, if we go in there and hedge it, less leaves, less photosynthesis, less water. Um, and then obviously we go in there and have a, <clears throat> a drought resistant root stock as well to kind of top it all off. So we can actually choose plant material that's going to be better suited for environmental you know, um, challenges. Sounds like a lot of planning and a lot of science, a lot of research I, <laughs> for each yeah, vineyard. I, it is. I, I think we do a good job of balancing the science and the art, mm -hmm. but it's fun. We have another question from Carmine uh, in regards to the Far Niente, the floating solar panels. Um, truly innovative. They have sparked the convergence of solar panels with water. My question is about the quality of water that you look for to apply your, to your vineyards. Do you do any treatment or add anything to assist the grapes? And also how many plants are in an acre? How many, yeah, vineyards, yeah. Um, good question, good questions. So we always test the water when we find our water source, for sure. There are a couple of factors that we need to look out for. Um, obviously salt, we don't wanna put salt out in the vineyard plants aren't gonna live with that. Um, there's some nutrients that we have to be careful of. If we see boron in the, in the water, that can be toxic to plants. So, so that's a, that's a no-go, that's a non-starter. If you, if you hit that, don't plant a vineyard. Um, and then you know, occasionally, because we have wineries on site, we'll, we'll have winery wastewater that we will process, filter, and apply out to the vineyard. So that's that's kind of, you know, that, that water gets a free ride. That, and, and that's that's really beneficial. Those can be high in bicarbonates. We have to be careful to bicarbonates. Um, but uh, it's it's good to dilute with some um, fresh water as well. So we can actually make use of it. And it can get us further without pulling from the well water that we're trying to reserve. Excellent. And I believe we have some more images to share here. So we're going to show off the uh, the cover crop, the mustard and the Saxon Priest vineyard, um, some water instruments that we use up at the Big Sky property and the weather tower. Oh, yeah. 
this is actually mustard. This mm -hmm. this is a you know co cover crops. I think we're going to talk about it in a bit, but this is a beautiful lush cover crop, and you know this is the Saxon Priest Vineyard. This is the, those are the vines that are going into the wine we're drinking. Mm -hmm. And the, the, those you know with with all the rain this place gets, this place gets three times as much rain as any of of our other vineyards. It's in like this weird you know banana belt. Just for some reason gets gets an exceptional amount of rain. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the cover crop does a really good job in preventing erosion. With all that rain, we need to be able to hold those roots in the soil and keep that stuff from running off. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, they promote beneficial insects. If we can get the cover crops to grow at the right time, it'll outcompete the weeds. Um, we can have nitrogen fixating cover crops to add nutrients and just overall plant health. Uh, marketing loves it. There's some aesthetics, right? Um, they're never happy when we mow it down before the photographer gets there. <laughs> Um, uh, there's several benefits to the uh, the old cover crop directly. Is this, a, is this a vineyard that we may incorporate sheep into in the future to kind of mow down all that mustard? Yeah, I would like to get them incorporated as much as possible. And I, I know we're going to touch on them in a bit, but they uh, they have, you know, it's kind of a win, win, win um, with, with the sheep. And they uh, they have more benefits than just eating the weeds. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Here, here we have, I think this was just to talk to water, mm -hmm. right? But um, you know, like I said, we we try to minimize our reliance on well water. You know, we, we need we need the sub basins in, in Napa and, and, and our properties. We need the aquifers to recharge every year. You know, that's it's not sustainable if, if they don't. It, it's, it needs to be a sustainable source of water for us. So what can we do to minimize our reliance on the groundwater? And, and this property here, that big, large body of water, that's 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 one of our biggest reservoirs we have at any of our properties. And none of it is fed by a well. Mm -hmm. We um, we we have drain tile in the ground, um, and we capture rainwater that's just roaming through the property when it rains, and place it into the reservoir, and we're able to get through the whole season off just that. That's 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 pretty cool water conservation when it comes to sustainability. And and I think the meter just talks to like the need to monitor, right? Mm -hmm. We need data. We need to make sure that what we're planning on using is what we're using. If there's a leak, this will tell us. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just important to, to continue gathering data. Mm -hmm. And how often do you go out there and check it or does someone else go out and check it? If it's, if it's, I was, I was standing out in the rain yesterday. I just, I couldn't help myself. You know, there, I don't, I, I, with the way things have been going with drought, every time it rains, I am just so excited. I check my, this is a weather station. I have the info on my, on my phone from every weather station we have. We have about 10 and I'd say every 10 minutes I was checking to see how much how much that rain dial was going up. I bet. Um, it's 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 really cool. I mean this is this is driving our success here. We're, without the water we're we're not we're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. So so this provides a lot of data for wind speed so we can make sure our sprays are being calibrated and and effectively and efficiently utilized. We, we can check relative humidity, make sure that frost and dew points and 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 any sort of risk to the vines is being met. Um it's obviously got the rain and the temperature uh, it's it's these things are state of the art. Mm -hmm. So all these tools are just improving winemaking. I mean, what did we do years and years ago without all this? Well, you know, you, you're, it's it's the whole art versus science argument, you know. Um, and I, I do think as a company, we do a really good job, kind of blending the two. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we speak to like water needs in the vineyard, right? Like we have we have technology now to measure stress in a vine. And, and establish thresholds to, to irrigate based off that. We have tools that can like, you can put on a leaf, a leaf barometer and, and measure um, the weather stations. But then again, like we're working with, we're working with some of the best farmers in the Napa Valley, mm -hmm. you know? And so these guys can go out and look at a vine and be like, look at the shoot tip. Is it actively growing or is it not? And, and or they can feel a leaf and say, this, this leaf doesn't have the, you know, the, they, these vines need water. And so, we, we look at both of those things and I think we do a really good job of, of bridging that gap or, or splitting that gap. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Thank you for sharing those photos with us. <laughs> Let's go ahead and touch on the Bella Union Cabernet. Last but not least, this is the 2019 Bella Union Cabernet. We've been uh, making this Bella Union Cab since 2012. And with this cab, it's really a blend of five main grape varietals, 
uh, from various vineyards throughout Napa Valley. So John, can you talk a little bit about where these grapes are grown? Um, I know we have a focus on Rutherford, but there are a number of other vineyards and ABAs throughout Napa Valley where we're sourcing this fruit from. Yeah, this, the beauty of this is, is, is the blend. Mm -hmm. um, we have, this is, this is all Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. We have, we have fruit, mostly Cabernet. And, and I think about 24% of this is actually other Bordeaux blenders. Mm -hmm. But we're talking, I mean, we're talking AVAs down in, down in Coombsville, where the Chardonnay comes from all the way up to Calistoga and, and, and all the Napa Valley AVAs in between. This is, this is, um, you know, this is a Rutherford brand, mm -hmm. but they also venture out. And so mm -hmm. this, this is the, this is that venture and, and our winemaker Brooke gets to have a lot of fun, uh, you know, toying with the spice cabinet of, of, of different varietals and, di you know, different percentages and different, different Cabernet Sauvignon vineyards throughout the valley. Exactly. And this is, uh, this recipe changes every year, depending on what she feels is fit to blend in to really create that art of the blend and that house style for Bella Union. Uh, so this is 75% Cabernet Sauvignon, 13% Merlot. So some pretty hefty Merlot in there, 8% Malbec, 3% Petit Verdot, and 1% Cab Franc. Oh. So good stuff. <clears throat> and let's just touch on the tasting notes as well while we're at it. So the aromas on here, you get some uh, really nice deep dark cherry, hints of clove, some barrel spice. Uh, again, this is aged in French oak for about 18 months. Uh, about 50% of the time in brand new French oak, the other half of the time in once used. Um, on the palate with this, it's very well structured, uh, velvety tannins, very prominent tannins right now. This is a 2019, it will surely benefit from a, a little more time in the bottle. And then you also get layers of blackberry and fig and some raspberry preserves. Mm. One thing I'll say, if I mm -hmm. may back up, for the vineyard sourcing, I know nickel and nickel is not on this lineup, but this wine gets to benefit from a lot of those mm -hmm. single vineyard vineyards that goes to nickel. And so where they might have their restrictions on no blending and, and no secondary vineyards, uh, Brooke gets to take advantage of that because as a company, when we develop a vineyard, we typically like to have a little fun with planting it and not just do all one variety. Mm -hmm. And so we'll sprinkle in a little of these blenders. And so they're all grown with the same concentration to quality. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, uh, I think that's where everything is kind of homogenized is that the quality approach, the quality, the qualitative approach. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's the Malbec or the Cab Franc or the Petit Verdot, um, these are top quality vineyards, top quality farming. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets the blend to where it's where it is. That's right. Like I believe uh, there's some De Carly vineyard in here. So if anyone's a fan of the nickel, nickel De Carly Cabernet, uh, there's quite a bit of that in here, um, along with all those other varieties. Uh, Air, Air Show, Quicksilver, De Carly are in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a great quality wine. Like for the price, uh, this is one that I often will buy for like get-togethers or parties, or if you have friends that are getting together, maybe they don't appreciate the higher end wines, but you still want something really nice. Uh, this is a, a great option for sure. We have another question that's uh, popped up here, uh, kind of going back to the owl boxes and whatnot. Uh, but uh, what is your pest control policy? Pest control policy? <laughs> I guess no. within the vineyards. Yeah. Uh, at the winery, we do get some pest as well, but uh, we usually just put them back out in the vineyards. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the pest control policy is... is is something we take very seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there should be, there should be very proactive measures, you know. Um, if we can do biocontrol like those owl boxes um, or even the provine mealybug, you know, if we can get out there early and have the, the predatory wasps released or use the, the mating disruption, if we can go out there and be proactive, we can minimize the need to be reactive. And that's where the real win is. So it's important to be knowledgeable, but it's also important to have set thresholds mm -hmm. and understand that when the pests have become a nuisance and we're seeing that with like climate change with with these mm -hmm. increased temperatures we're seeing added populations and when insects populate it's exponential mm -hmm. and so we have to make sure we get ahead of that mm -hmm. otherwise we're not doing our, our neighborly duty we don't want to be the source we don't want to be the harbor for our neighbor to get, get the same problems we have so we need to stay ahead of it. And, the, and, the, and the truth is it's about 
proactive measures and being ready to respond as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So going back to the Bella Union Cabernet, uh, when, re when replanting, it, is it important to give the land time to regenerate nutrients or can you plant right away? When we, we pull out a vineyard, you know, what, what, what we've been doing, and I really like this, it's, it's new to me and I'm really excited about rolling this out for, for all the years to come. Mm -hmm. We buy about 25 tons of compost per acre. That's 50,000 pounds of compost per acre. Accounting hates it. It's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and we, it's not cheap. And they're like, where's the return? Like, what's this immediate return? It's soil health, right? Mm -hmm. It's soil health. So we'll, we'll go out there with this absurdly large amount of compost per acre after we pull a vineyard out. We'll seed it with cover crop for an annual mix. It gets, it gets at the appropriate time, September, October, put your seed out. That'll grow. And then in the next year, when it's time to do the soil work, we'll wait for the perfect soil moisture content, which is we want it to be pretty low so that when we send the disc through, we can incorporate all this compost, 25 tons an acre. We can incorporate that. We can incorporate the organic matter from the cover crops that grew. And we can go and get planting that very next year and be better off for it than if we were just to have waited two or three years with natural growth. Mm -hmm. And our soils are very healthy. Like we don't have dead zones for the most part, right? Like the, of the vineyards that we primarily maintain. No, no, we, we don't. Our, we, we, we take a very environmentally conscious approach to soil health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to touch on the sheep, I mean, they're really contributing to the health of the vineyards at the Sullinger vineyard at Nickel Nickel and also at the Stelling vineyard over at the Farniente estate, correct? They, well, they did. So we had well, They did, they're we had, gone. We had to, we had to, <laughs> they're on summer vacation now. We had to kick them out. They, um, you know, once the vines start growing, we have to be very careful to um, make sure the sheep aren't there to potentially knock off the emerging shoot tips or God forbid start eating the vines because they will. And so um, they're out, they, uh, they did their job, we had them. And uh, now they've gone home, um, they, they've, they've got their grass diet, they've got their greens in and now they're going home to eat some grains and get full. Mm -hmm. And did, they, did you see the benefits this year or is it gonna take a few years? You know, the, the true benefit I can only speak for Farniente, but the, what our focus points are right now are reducing carbon emissions, fossil fuel emissions, and conserving water. And so, yes, sheep come in and eat the weeds. That's clear. Everyone knows that. But what, what we're really doing is we're eliminating that first tractor pass to get the weeds down. And we've just, all the transport, the semis up and down the highway with the tractors, eliminated the first pass. The tractors up and down every single row, eliminated first pass. Um, the sheep have, have eaten the weeds that would have stolen the natural so soil moisture from the vines, mm -hmm. the vines get that. So, so we, we're hitting our two focus points here. We're, we're, we're reducing carbon emissions immediately with sheep and we're conserving water. Now, yes, they control weeds and controlling weeds helps with frost protection. They're, those are good, but those behind the scenes reasons are, it's just like a, it's a win, 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 win with the sheep. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty unique, pretty special. And then we're hoping to roll it out aggressively next year. I think everyone could agree that we'd rather see more sheep in the vineyards than semis with tractors on them rolling through the valley. <laughs> so do you think we'll have them in more of our vineyards next year and maybe how many of the vineyards? Yeah, we built a good relationship this year with our with our sheep guy. Um, and so we're going to um, we'll, we'll expand on it for sure. Now, obviously, there is a scale where it is justified. I don't want to have to trailer in sheep for a couple acres of vineyard. I think that would almost defeat the purpose. So I think we have a set threshold. We have, we have some, we are fortunate enough to have some properties that are really going to justify this. And so we'll probably roll this out on any property that's over like 30 acres. So we're 30 acres and up, they get sheep next year. Excellent. All right. Well, now we're going to start promoting everyone to panelists and we invite you to share uh, your video so you can join us for a, cr a group Q&A. So turn on your videos if you can, video cameras. Uh, in the meantime, let me ask some of the questions that have come through on the Q&A chat that we haven't touched on. Um, we also still have some questions that were submitted to us prior to this. So let me take a look through here. 
Oh, and then also, John, are you able to share with us any of the coming projects from Farniente Family of Wineries and Vineyards that are going to develop over the next year? I would love to. I touched on the Saxon Priest development, so I'll, I'll leave that be. That's that's pretty cool. But keep trying this wine. This Saxon Priest wine is my favorite <laughs> Pinot, and it's only getting better. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. This 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 one's pretty special. Now we have two other projects I can touch on, and one of them was from that Carneros place that had the bees. Mm -hmm. um, that that was a that was a recent acquisition. So we're gonna have 130 acres of vines down there. We're, we're, we're growing. Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, a little bit of Semillon for Dolce. We're growing some Malbec. It's, it's a big project. It's a very sustainable place. It's located close to the San Pablo Bay with cooler, with cooler temperatures, lower water needs, no well water. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a big project that we're taking on aggressively. All the new technologies, all the new infrastructure. This is, this is mostly new vineyard with the right row orientation, right trellis design, clean material, right root stock. This is huge, and this is going to be rolling out. This has been my biggest project, the, the most fun I've ever had at work, and I'm so thrilled about it. Um, not to steal from our other project, which is equally as cool, but we also are redeveloping the Stelling Vineyard with the Oakville Cabernet, mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty special in that. Uh, uh, I hope no one from accounting is watching, but uh, <laughs> I, I like that one because it's basically like do whatever you have to do to do it right. Mm -hmm. and. I've never had that direction ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's like triple hose, trip, trip, triple irrigation hose, you know, frost fans, um, uh, a lot of steel to design this trellis system. Um, it's, it's really fun. And the, and the goal is 100 point Cabernets. Get there. You get there and you yeah, don't take any shortcuts. Just yeah. exactly. That's unique. I've never been told that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a few other questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, how about during the growing season, how much communication do you have with the winemakers when growing the grapes? And are the winemakers out there in the vineyards? Um, I know most of them are on a pretty regular basis, but how do you all communicate everything? And uh, there's so many different vineyards we have now that you have to keep an eye on, especially during harvest season. Yeah, we have, well, first of all, my boss is, is a winemaker. You know, I, I report directly to the vice president uh, winemaking and him and I talk almost every day and I love it I love our communication he always wants to have a pulse on the vineyards I always like to hear what's going on in his world and um, so there's that now the four other winemakers of each brand it's actually interesting how there's almost a difference in you know when they're present in the vineyard I see that some of them are actually quite present in the slow season you know the dormant season into pruning they want to see what the pruning's like they want to they want to see what the season's shaping up to be early there's other winemakers that kind of show up mid-season mm -hmm. and ask, hey, why are we behind on this? Or let's get going on that, you know, when we're at the peak labor demand. And then there's, there's, there's also the, the you know, the pre-harvest vineyard checks. And it's almost like, you know, they all have different, different times. They actually like to come out and, and uh, meet and greet and talk and, and you know, plan. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question here. I don't know if... Um... I don't know if we'd really be able to answer this, but uh, how do you pick the names and labels or probably brands? Um, but I know like the Saxon priest, like that's named after uh, a species of apple that was previously grown over in Russian River Valley, correct? That's, I mean, our en route brands, a lot of the names are derived from these former apple orchards, correct? That's right. And this, this company is glad that it doesn't have me responsible for naming our, our wine um, skews. That's for sure. I am, I, my creative side would, would not pull through. Uh, that, that's definitely a marketing. That's mm -hmm. definitely a marketing responsibility. And, mm -hmm. and we're better off for it. <laughs> yes. And the different brands, it's really just specializing in different styles of wine, like nickel and nickel only make single vineyard wines. We have 18 different Cabernets now. Uh, en route makes single vineyard Pinots, except for the Le Palmier, which is a blend. And then with Farniente, of course, you have the classic Chardonnay and the two Cabernets, one from Oakville, one from Napa Valley. So it's really just dif differentiating between those different brands and those styles and different winemakers for each of those as well. So let's see what else we have here. What are the average yields for Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Pinot? Does it vary from year to year? Yes, absolutely. 
it's yield is dictated by a lot of things. You know, you, you set your year up when you prune the vine and how, how many buds you leave. Um, those, those buds fruitfulness was determined the previous year uh, to go into some specifics. But then when bloom hits, which is typically in May, um, we're gonna see the fruit set and then we can start counting how many berries are on each cluster. And that compared to what average numbers are, which we have that data, we'll be able to dictate the fluctuation. And if it's a really good set, we're probably gonna have to go in and trim some out, but it's, it's better to start high work low than like typically bad fruit sets don't get better. Typically if, if it's a bad fruit set, it only gets worse. We, uh, we probably look to be about four tons per acre, you know, on the high end cab, maybe three on the high end shard around four. And then, you know, if we're lucky, if I'm lucky and I can get away with it, we'll go five. But sometimes I have, uh, you know, there's, there's other people that play a part and, um, you know, the whole tonnage per acre thing is a sensitive subject sometimes. And uh, as the grower, you, you want it, you want to knock it out of the park and have a bumper crop, but then the winemakers have to, you know, reel you in and make sure you're hitting qualitative goals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, just so you guys know, if anyone has any questions, we encourage you to turn on your cameras and ask it live. We want this to be very interactive. And it also helps us find you if you're able to use the raise your hand button, and then we can call on you as well. Anyone have any unanswered questions? Oh, someone asked about the artwork on the bottles. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, so yes. the wine bottles, the labels, uh, very art deco on some of them. The label artist is Thomas Rodriguez. He's been designing our labels since the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, so we first designed the Farniente Chardonnay label and he's now a consultant all throughout Sonoma and Napa County as a label designer. And he still designs many of our labels, but yeah, great question. They're very unique. They're very distinct in a, a wine shop or on a, a dinner table as well. Oh, here's a good question. Um, John, this is a good one for you. If, if you're familiar with uh, these regions, would there be any wisdom in trying to incorporate grapes from another region in the country like Traverse City, Michigan, or wherever, maybe some of these other wine regions that are becoming more and more prevalent outside of California? Well, I don't believe nickel and nickel is um, constrained to just California. I would love to see a little uh, nickel and nickel uh, outside of the state's um, single vineyard program. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about the logistics of getting the shipping of costs involved now with everything going on to, to blend it into uh, one of our other um, brands. All right, uh, Stephen, Stephen Castro, you have a question for us? Okay, I'm interested in the parties. When are they coming back? <laughs> The parties. We have one coming up in June and then we have a um, party, a few wine club events all throughout the country. So those should all be available on our website. We may be able to have someone pop that up right now uh, in the chats, uh, but all those events should be listed under the wine club section on the website, but we can definitely send you some additional info as well. Some more detailed info. Sounds good. <laughs> but yes, they're finally making a comeback. <laughs> We're looking forward to our, our first big event in the year, of the year in June, which was postponed from, it was January, February originally. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, Tara, um, looks like you've got, oh, Kaylee. Looks like uh, for Tara, we had a, looks like you've got a good crew tu tuning in. I can't see everyone's, oh, I can see Tara's there. Hello, everyone. Well, Hello. Hello. joining us. Yes, thank you. Have you all been enjoying the wines? Yes, we yes. have. Yes. Very much. We're, We're coming out to now. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, great. What are you guys visiting? <laughs> We're booking flights now. We're booking flights now. <laughs> it's happening <Great>. live. <laughs> 
Did you all have a, a favorite wine out of these three? I know they're all so different, but uh, any uh, top the Pinot, contenders? The Pinot, Pinot Noir. I think we were all in agreement about. Yes. And I yeah. think the Chardonnay, we were pleasantly surprised about. Yes. Mm. Yeah. With, uh, with none of us really being Chardonnay drinkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hear that a lot. So some Chardonnays can be really big and full and buttery. Uh, yes. But ours is very crisp, yes. light. Uh, so it's just a different yes. style of, of winemaking, really. But yes, ours is very unique. And we have those Charlemagne clones. And, you know, as John was uh, speaking to, this can make the uh, wine itself, the style, very unique. I have a friend, Meg, here that has a mildew question. Oh, boy. Yeah. I guess mildew. <laughs> you need more nickel in there. Yes. How do you prevent mildew on your crop? With all the rain. With all the rain. You mentioned that earlier that there was a significant amount of rainfall. How do you deal with the potential Nick. for mold on the grapes? I'm sorry, mold. Sorry. Mold. Good question. So, so the, yeah, the spores are active. That rain's not helping at all. But um, <laughs> what, what we do is uh, we kind of reset the clock on the <laughs> no deal prevention plan and, um, and get out there ASAP. We can't wait now. After these rains come, and even with rains in the forecast, you have to use your window of dry weather to get in there and smother these out. So right now, basically, what we're going in with is um, is an oil-based product. Um, it just it's a physical control. It, it's it's like one percent dilution in, a, in in your spray, and it's it actually smothers the spores and prevents them from populating. And so that's, that's what we're doing right now is trying to get ahead of this because we have more rains coming, but we need to we need to take care of what's been. Um, what's been spread now to keep it from um, spreading further after the next rains. Wow. Do you still do you still use those big fans to like circulate the air out there in the vineyard or or, or is that not used anymore? Thank you for asking that. I, I, I actually meant to touch on that earlier. We we do and we're we're investing heavily into more fans. These are not cheap. Those gigantic fans that no one no one's a fan, none of the neighbors are fans of. Yeah. Uh, intended. Yes. Um, <laughs> intended. Intended. <laughs> uh, you know when if you can prevent frost with the fans, and so this is not mildew related. The the fans are are frost related. Yeah. And so if you can if you can get by with your fans instead of the high impact sprinklers, high impact sprinklers are using millions of gallons of water per night, mm -hmm. and so you you make the big investment into these fans. And you're avoiding not only not only are you conserving water from a sustainability perspective, but you're avoiding saturating the soil to a to a point where you're no longer able to control the stress in that vine. And so it's actually a qualitative improvement to the vine and, and fruit health. And it's also very sustainable with, with minimizing water usage. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. I meant to actually touch on that. Thank you. <laughs> Another question from Doris Lee, are grapes physically harvested or mechanically harvested? That's a good one. Both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been some crazy technology advancements in machine harvesting where I have some, we, we, we actually incorporate both. And Farniente Chardonnay actually has a, 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 a relatively small percentage, actually pretty, pretty small percentage uh, is machine harvested. Um, and that is, it's very effective because at harvest, there's a peak labor demand. And so it's great from my perspective. I have, I have two guys. I have the guy operating the machine and the guy taking the, 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 the trailers to him. Two guys are doing what you have 20 guys doing the next day. Unbelievable. But the benefit qualitatively is it actually, it kind of pops the berry off the rachis and there's a slight bit of oxidation. And Nicole likes a slight bit of oxidation. So if she can do that naturally with a bit of machine harvesting, it's a win-win. And we both get, so I get, I get to have our crews focused on the other picks while, my two, while the two guys are running the machine. And so we get to double down on harvest, fill up tanks. It's, it's great. And, and, and the technology is, my God, the, the vineyard, you, you would walk in afterwards and a canopy still intact. Every little rachis, all the stems are still there on the vines. Nothing's broken. And, and you just have this, it looks like a sea of just marbles. No, no leaves, no, no stems. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Question from Sarah. Do you have a recommendation for how long to decant different types of wine? We are having a blast trying all the wines. 
Uh, that is great to hear. Glad you're enjoying them. Uh, as far as decanting wines, it really depends on the vintage, how old it is, uh, the varietal. So like an older wine, you may not want to decant it as long because it's already been aging in the bottle. You may want to decant it just to remove the sediment and then serve it uh, soon after. But it really depends if you'd like any more detailed information on that, or if you have any specific wines in mind, I'm happy to answer that further. If you'd like to email me at any point, we'll, we can provide that after this. And then uh, Tatum is asking, can you speak to the recycling that is done in the life of a farm? Recycling. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, in a perfect world, we're just going to have dirt and vines, uh, you know, um, at the end of the, at the end of a vineyard life, we'll, we'll end up with some steel, um, from the trellis, which will get recycled. But, um, you know, really we, we don't really want anything in the vineyard. That's, that's not a, a vine and, and, and just what's in the site. So we'll have, we'll have some drip tube and some hose and some steel from the trellis. And that's really it, you know, um, historically speaking, a lot of, uh, a lot of vineyards had like plastic tie tie tape to uh, train the vines. We've gone to we've gone to um, rope, which uh, you know obviously biodegrades. Um, so so recycling is is there when 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 we have anything to recycle, but we try to avoid anything that's not just natural and try to just get it to be just the vines, just the vineyard. Excellent. What do you suggest as a food pairing with the Chardonnay? John, do you have any favorite food pairings for the 2020 Farniente Chardonnay so far? I've been any enjoying that come to mind? Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, put on the spot, but. I, no, I am not, you know, I, I'll defer. <laughs> well, for me, like anything seafood related goes excellent with this. I mean, it's so crisp and light. You can really enjoy it on its own or with a nice cheese plate, uh, roast chicken, Dover sole mignon or a lobster roll. Um, I believe we have a number of recipes on our website. So that is a good source as well. We usually post seasonal recipes. So that is a, a great resource. So don't forget to check that out. And we have pairings for our other wines as well. So definitely check that out. All right. Any other questions? You know, I, I will say before we wrap up, mm -hmm. just from like a sustainability perspective is that we are, we are truly fortunate in, in this wine grape industry. You know, this, this agricultural industry is, is typically very conservative, very slim margin. You have to just do whatever you have to do to make a dollar. Um, and we are, we're at this weird crossroad, you know, this, this, we're, we're, we're privileged to be at this crossroad where agriculture is meeting a luxury product. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're actually able to kind of be at the forefront of sustainability efforts. And sometimes things work and sometimes they don't, but we're at a point where we get to, to trial these trial and error. And so it's, it's, it's really fascinating for us in the vineyard to be able to do these and then Mm -hmm. communicate our efforts to down, down the line to, to anyone and everyone uh, that could benefit from them. Right. It's a progress, not perfection. So you're always, you know, looking for new ways to excel and increase the health of the land for, you know, vintages to come. Yeah, 100%. It, and it's not just, it's not just like fun and interesting for us. It's almost a, should be looked at as in a sense, a um, responsibility of ours. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, one more question here. How long do you suggest that the en route age in the bottle? Uh, great question. Um, it can be personal preference. Um, I know our winemaker has suggested maybe five to 10 years uh, before it's past its prime, but if you're you know, cellaring it in very optimal conditions, then it could you know, hold up much longer. So it, you know, not everyone likes the taste of older wines. So I like my like my nickel nickel wines within seven to 10 years. So they have more fruit, more vibrancy, but they can certainly age longer than that. Uh, but again, it's, it's personal preference, but this is tasting great already. The 2019. Yeah. All right, Tara, one more question from, from your group. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So a uh, question just about the process and the fermentation. 
So I know a lot about making beer and the yeast selection and how it affects the flavor. How does that work with wine? as far as the type of yeast to use, the strain, and, and how that can affect things? That is a great question. Um, so it's different for all the different wines that we have. So that's something that the winemakers could speak more to. Um, I don't have those all listed, but I know that they can resource uh, different yeast, uh, whatever is most optimal for those wines. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have a winemaker here. Um, or which, one, which wine are you more uh, interested in? in regards to that, all of them? Just more of more just in general. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of different yeast strains that you can add to different wines. So it really just varies. It's really what the winemaker's recipe is, what their take on it is. So yeah, there are a lot of variables in that, but we can send you some more information on that as well. We can uh, make a note of that. I can, I can say that. Um, <laughs> and we can maybe touch on it in an, on another uh, hosted at home in the future. Kaylee can make a note of it and uh, can definitely address that because it's, you know, this is art and science in a bottle and it definitely is uh, a lot of science that these winemakers are very well trained to do. Sure. They're, they're, they are very particular though, every, every <laughs> step of the way. I mean, if it's, if it's from the time they want to keep their fruit soaking before they start fermentation to the yeast they use, to the barrels they choose, to to, to, to the length they leave it in barrel. I mean, there there's very particular uh, demands and wants from from their perspective. It's it's actually quite fascinating. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good question, there, buddy. It's a very good question. I'm still not convinced. All right. So well, I believe we're going to get this wrapped up here. If anyone thinks of any questions later on, feel free to send us a message. You can email us or give us a call. Uh, but thank you all for attending. Later, you'll receive an email, which includes information on the wines in the next shipment and a recording of today's tasting. And if you enjoyed the wines today, you can use the code HOSTED at checkout and receive 20% savings and complimentary shipping. So cheers to a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to you all joining us next month. Cheers. Cheers, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.